Dr. Basma Kadmani, welcome to the ANU Media. Uh, Dr. Kadmani is uh, the director of the Arab Reform Initiative and also associate professor attending the um, Crawford Leadership Forum. Uh, I wanted to ask you what is your view of the current situation in Syria? How do you think the peace process, or if there is one, is going? We have a political process of an, or a negotiation process led by the United Nations with a special envoy, with terms of reference for the process, etc. But the reality is we do not have any real negotiations so far. Uh, we had uh, seven, eight, nine rounds so far going to Geneva every time and having no direct negotiations. Uh, the opposition delegation uh, representing uh, all the different groups of the opposition uh, has agreed to a certain agenda for the talks on constitution, election, security and political transition. Uh, on the side of the Syrian government we have no acceptance so far of engaging directly. So we have indirect talks with the UN Special Envoy uh, about these issues, uh, but we don't have any real bilateral negotiations. We are looking forward to having those, but the Syrian regime has not agreed so far. But the Syrian situation is so complex. Uh, do you think that the best way to proceed in order to secure a viable political resolution of the conflict is for Washington and Moscow to reach an understanding? And what do you think, what, what's your assessment of the chances of such an understanding being reached between these two major powers? Well, as you know, this, the conflict started with an uprising, a popular uprising against an authoritarian regime. So it was a Syrian domestic issue. It turned into a regional conflict and has become now international because it has involved the United States and Russia heavily, Russia more heavily than the United States. I think what we have seen over the last seven years is that the engagement of regional forces has been uh, disruptive very disruptive and has uh, complicated the situation. So my sense is today we need an agreement between Russia and the United States in order to bring the regional powers uh, to some, uh, to accept uh, certain constraints on their uh, behavior on their involvement in Syria, particularly the withdrawal of their troops. We have uh, militias that are organized and led by Iran directly on Syrian soil. We have uh, fighters and, and uh, commanders and officers from the Revolutionary Guards of uh, Iran. We have the presence of the Turkish army, we have US forces, we have Russian forces, and we have uh, groups coming from across the region, transnational actors, all of these players, I feel cannot be brought, uh, uh, cannot be reined in until we have an agreement between Russia and the United States about which are their legitimate interests in this region, what are their responsibilities as international powers and members of the Security Council, co responsible for collective security. We have a very attentive Israeli partner, uh, sorry, uh, neighbor looking at what is happening on Syrian territory, intervening uh, militarily with its air force. So all of this uh, can, I think, only be brought under control by the United States and Russia agreeing on what a political process should be. We had some agreement between President Putin and President Trump last year, but that has not turned into anything effectively on the ground so far. Uh, do you see any space for the Assad regime in the process of negotiations? I mean, uh, my understanding is that uh, you wouldn't want the Assad regime to collapse immediately, and uh, you would like to see it as part of a very peaceful and democratic transition. Look, we engage on the basis of uh, we want an orderly transition in Syria, but we certainly want a transition out of authoritarianism. We want a full change of the political system. So we are looking for a serious political transition. That uh, means that the Assad regime as it is today cannot continue. Now, we would ideally like to see a gradual transition, an orderly. 
uh, preserving the institutions of the state, but certainly not those agencies that work, that are involved in very, very major crimes against humanity and war crimes. Uh, they need to go through prosecution processes. We need a transitional justice process for Syria, but uh, we first of all need a, to see that we have a partner to engage with. So far, uh, the Assad regime has not engaged in negotiations. So as much as we would like this to be a negotiated process, uh, we are not seeing that uh, that party is engaging on the Syrian uh, regime side. So we look to Assad's uh, protectors, Assad's allies, uh, and uh, first and foremost, we look to Russia uh, for it to see that it is in its interest to build a new legitimacy in Syria, which is a new s political system with a government that involves, that represents the people, represents all groups in Syria, uh, that brings back stability, uh, brings some rule of law to the country, uh, simple uh, criteria for decent and legitimate governance for the country. Russia is more our interlocutor, unfortunately, than uh, the regime itself today. And Dr. Kudmani, uh, Australia has been involved uh, uh, in fighting uh, violent extremism in the uh, region, and uh, not only in Syria, but also to some extent, uh, not only in Iraq, but also to some extent in Syria. What contributions a country like Australia could make to the um, a process of a negotiated settlement? I think by, uh, by saying, first of all, uh, Australia is a democratic country, a democratic country that uh, has credibility when it talks about building legitimate governance and building a legitimate political system. That's what we need to hear. The legitimacy here is the key word for building a transition, for um, organizing a transition in Syria, and uh, after that, uh, or in accompaniment of that, having a reconstruction of the country, the return of refugees, the withdrawal of foreign forces. So I think where uh, a country like Australia can engage uh, uh, is engage those countries that are directly involved in Syria. Uh, we have uh, Iran on the ground, we have uh, Russia on the ground which need to be uh, engaged to see what exactly they want in Syria and what is compatible with rebuilding a sovereign uh, country of, in Syria where Syrians uh, lead their future. So I think this is one aspect. The other aspect is uh, Australia has been contributing hugely to the humanitarian effort. Uh, it would certainly want to see other than just f providing food and shelter for people, but the return of these people to their homes and rebuilding the country. So in the reconstruction process, which we all look forward to see happen as soon as possible for Syrians to be able to return to their country, uh, then we would like to see that uh, the important consideration and the indicator is a legitimate transition uh, in, in politics, in the political system. That Australia can certainly advocate, can certainly work uh, towards seeing legitimacy built in order for reconstruction to be shaped uh, in the direction of consolidating legitimacy and not consolidating one group against another. And that brings me to my last question, and that is that uh, the reconstruction of Syria. I mean, this is going to really cost billions and billions of dollars. Not to mention that Syria has lost a generation of its people and uh, half of the population uh, has uh, left the country and all that, uh, which really requires the return of all these people to, uh, to their homeland. Uh, but just the physical reconstruction of Syria is going to be so much that is ve one is very highly doubtful that, for example, a country like Russia or Iran or a combination of the two uh, ca can really make uh, uh, that degree or that amount of contributions uh, to enable the Syrians to rebuild their lives and their country. So that, that will really require the efforts of the international community as a whole. And for that reason, it is absolutely imperative to have a practical settlement of the uh, conflict. Indeed, I think where the, the real weight of countries such as Australia, such as the European Union, Canada, the United States can really step in at the moment when uh, the political change uh, brings uh, an acceptable um, means, the acceptable ways of uh, doing the reconstruction. Because, of course, it's hundreds of billions, it's very costly, but it's also about how you channel 
this, this aid. Can a country like Australia or the European Union come into the country and channel this aid through a corrupt system? Obviously not. A system that has no law that governs any of its actions? Obviously not. So what we're looking to build is rule of law and which channels are safe in order not to feed into the corrupt system that we've had, which is a predatory uh, system uh, which has really uh, impoverished the population and enriched the ruling elite. So uh, it is really about governance, it's really about which channels to use and reconstruction then can happen. Whether it happens in two years, five years, 20 years is less important than making sure the channels you use are for the benefit of the people and for the purposes that you are putting that money into the country for. So that's where the real weight of country, democratic countries uh, such as Australia can really uh, make a difference. Well, let's hope uh, for a better future, at least for the sake of the Syrian people. And thank you very much. For thank you very much, us. Professor Saikin.